The truth about global warming. For the first time, legendary broadcaster Sir David Attenborough speaks out about global warming. The key question, of course, is how can we distinguish between variations due to natural causes and those variations of the climate that are induced by human activity. And the key thing that convinced me at any rate was a graph like this one that we marked out on the floor that had been prepared from climate scientists like Professor Peter Cox. Now explain to us the significance of this graph. OK, what we're going to do is to take a walk through time. And the first thing to note as we walk through is that it's, the climate is naturally variable. It's a spiky beast. Occasionally there's a downward trend that's associated with a volcano going off that cools the system down because of the dust it throws up. But generally it just oscillates around. And then we get to a period around about 1910 where you can start to see an upward trend, uh, a warming of the climate, a global warming if you like. And the issue is, what caused that? Was that humans or was that natural? So what we do to try and work that one out is to take a climate model and to put in the various factors. And what we can see with this green curve here is a climate model that includes just these natural factors. So this is when volcanoes go off and the output from the sun. And you can see that the green curve can reproduce reasonably well this mid-century warming. So up to this point, you could reasonably argue climate variation can be explained by natural factors. But as we move on, we can see that's no longer true as you get to the latter part of the 20th century. From about 1970 onwards here, you can see the red curve, the observed temperatures, and the green curve really beginning to diverge. And the question again is, what caused this recent warming? So we run the model again and we include human factors. Particularly we include the greenhouse effect, from, uh, mostly from carbon dioxide that comes from fossil fuel burning. And then we get this yellow curve and we can see, as well as reproducing the mid-century warming, we get this recent rather rapid warming reproduced and that tells us two things one is that the model looks realistic it looks like the real world and the second thing the model tells us that this recent warming is due to human beings so there you have it there seems little doubt that this recent rise this steep rise in temperature is due to human activity if you look at the green line of natural variability it's clear that without the action of human beings, there would have been far less temperature change since the 1970s. It's an embarrassment. That's how one of Canada's leading environmental activists describes the government's new climate change plan. David Suzuki feels the strategy falls short of what's needed and what Canadians want. And he joins us now to tell us more about his concerns. So when you say it's an embarrassment, is there nothing of merit in what the government's proposing? Well, of course, it's, it's taking uh, at least the, the rhetoric of climate change uh, uh, seriously. But I think what's embarrassing, it's more than embarrassing. I mean, this is really a scam. Mm. What the government is uh, trying to do is give the illusion of movement uh, by talking about reducing the intensity and, and hard targets. But the reality is it's really a cover for allowing industry to continue to increase its pollution. So it's not seriously addressing the emissions problem. And does that explain, in your view, why we're not hearing uh, howls of outrage from industry? Sure. I mean, he's, his consultation, he says he's consulted. Well, I met him uh, within days after he was appointed minister, and I, I begged him. I said, look, groups like ours have been working on this issue for years. Please come and use what we've done. He never called me again after that first meeting until I called him uh, just a couple of weeks ago. So he's never exploited the environmental community. He's been consulting industrial uh, leaders and he's been consulting economists, mm -hmm. but never the environmental community. So, uh, you know, the opposition parties have been saying, uh, like you, that this is a sham and really that the path is clear and the path is honoring the commitments laid out in the Kyoto Protocol. Of course, John Baird and his government is saying that would trigger a recession. So, based on the studies that uh, right. you and your colleagues have done, what's the, what's the real picture here? Well, the, the, the problem is that what he has done by showing that there will be a loss of over 200,000 jobs and a recession mm -hmm. is that he's had a group of economists take the worst case scenario 
And then, of course, the result comes out exactly the way they've been saying for 20 years. This is going to be ruinous. We can't do anything. But he hasn't had a, a balanced look at what are the opportunities that come from taking this seriously. And there are huge opportunities in clean energy and retrofitting uh, in cleaner air that will reduce our medical expenses. So he's exaggerated it in a way that becomes ludicrous. And... Uh, well, I mean, it just isn't seriously addressing the fact that our emissions are continuing to rise. So if, if everyone agrees that there, there are costs to be paid here, yes. then when looking at the Kyoto plan or looking at what you consider to be a realistic and meaningful plan, what in, in general terms is the cost that industry has to pay? Do we know that? I don't. I have no idea. Uh, let me just tell you, though, that we've had the fossil fuel industry making windfall profits now for years and the price of fuel is not going to go down it's just going to continue to rise are you telling me the fossil fuel industry can't afford to do anything now the problem is that the tar sands are being developed at an explosive rate mm -hmm. what this government is saying is look we are going to reduce the intensity as the the per unit uh, energy intensity is going to increase that is each barrel of oil coming out of the tar sands will reduce the amount of energy it takes. But it's going to expand threefold in the coming years. So that means total emissions are going to continue to rise. So um, I'm saying, wait a minute now. Don't tell me the fossil fuel industry cannot afford to pay its share. I mean, uh, and, and let's look at the examples of countries, Sweden, Germany, um, uh, Norway, these are countries that seem to me to be competitive globally, economically. Why is it that they're going to meet their Kyoto target and they're not talking about reductions down 40, 50, 60 percent below 1990 levels? Now, I know you've been busy uh, talking to Canadians across the country and you believe that Canadians on an individual basis are prepared to step up and pay whatever is required, right? There's no question in my mind. Canadians are very, very concerned about climate change and they're willing to do what it, it takes to do their part but they don't like the fact that they are going to be burdened more than say the private sector why is it that the heavy polluters have been given a lighter ride and as Canadians just try to get their heads around the kinds of costs that they should be thinking about, can you walk us through that? I mean, I suppose uh, if you want to start considering now about paying for a hybrid car, that's one way to go. Are there certain other areas that sort of fit into the cost category that People may be willing to pay, but they just need to think about, you know, identifying. Well, where they what pay. we've got to do is encourage people by giving them incentives, and I think the government has done that in a tiny way with what is basically a, a carbon tax by saying that the big gas guzzlers, you're going to have to pay a tax for that, and that will be used then for the people that are getting things like hybrid uh, vehicles. You're going to get uh, a rebate on that. That's a carbon tax, really. We need stronger incentives like that to encourage people. So that means you can get a very energy efficient vehicle for a cheaper price and you're going to save on on uh, gas prices as gas continues to rise in price but i think that the idea of a dollar and a quarter a dollar fifty for a liter of gas people are going to have to to realize it's going to go up that now, you know i know you've been waxing eloquent uh, about this issue and saying it's an urgent issue we've got to we've got to act now because time is running out so if that's the case, based on what we've seen from the Harper government, based on what we're hearing from opposition parties, I've been talking about it as a two solitudes kind of scenario. Is this the kind of thing where it is time to have an election on this issue? That Canadians, there almost has to be a referendum on this issue in the form of an election. Well, I certainly think whatever triggers the next election, the environment and climate are going to be one of the top issues that are going to be uh, discussed. And that's certainly the, the theme of my travel across Canada. Canada is I said to 30,000 Canadians you've put it on the agenda your concern is the reason Mr. Harper is attempting to to have a green policy it was never a part of his program when he was elected mm -hmm. and I think he's been very reluctantly dragged there by Canadian interest so my message to them is keep it on the agenda an election is coming you've got to make it a critical part of this next election and after the election we have to keep that pressure up okay. yes in a way, it will become a referendum. David, good to talk to you. Thanks for being with us. Good to be here.